Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at At Home with Rick Geary, Collected Stories, 1977 to 1985. This was published by Fanographics Books, um, the earliest collection of Rick Geary stuff. Rick Geary is one of my favorite cartoonists of all time. He, nobody draws like him, obviously. But there's, you know, comic book stylists who have their, a unique uh, art style, drawing style. But Rick Geary, nobody writes like him. He is just writes the most funniest, quirkiest little stories throughout his career. Um, I Hopefully, as we look through this, you'll get a sense or a flavor of the Rick Geary sense of humor. Totally unique. And I'm talking about any medium. I can't think of any... Uh, you know, screenwriter or novelist who's he's just got this amazing sense of humor. I ever since I was a little kid, I found his stuff in various anthologies, heavy metal, National Lampoon, Epic Illustrated, everywhere. And I always thoroughly enjoyed them. Even when I was little, I was like, probably didn't maybe didn't even understand some of them. There's just something very joyful about his comics, um, but also very is sardonic the right word. <laughs> I don't know, just very wry, interesting sense of humor. Uh, maybe dry is the word I actually meant. Um, you know, it's not like uh, over-the-top goofy humor like Cowboy Hank, but just very interesting. I love this co color, this color cover. It's very rare to see Rick Gary in color. Very nice sense of color. I assume he colored this himself. This book w was published in 1985. And at this point, Rick Geary was pretty much, uh, you know, around when I discovered him, early 80s or something, just drawing lots of short stories for all these various publications. Um, you may know that in the past 20 years, Rick Geary has cranked out graphic novel after gra graphic novel. Um, Tales of Victorian Murders is a long-running series he's had where he just tells, like, you know, historical um tales in graphic novel form about all these famous murders um he even has a series of you know 20th century murders he's got um bi biographies of uh various historical figures he's got um tales of the old west he just cranks them out i think he self-publishes some of them even but uh kind of unfortunate because i really miss rick Gary just cranking out these weird little one-pagers and two-pagers and three-pagers, which is what he did for a long time. Just beautiful drawing on the title page here. <laughs> the Inside Out House, a seat featured in life. And this couple own a house where all the, it's all inside out. Just so, I just love this guy. Introduction by Dale Luciano, long time uh, at the time, uh, Comics Journal journalist and um it's a, it really sums up uh, rick geary and his appeal in much uh, a smarter way than i will <laughs> Dale luciano is a very good writer very good um you know comic book analyst nice little drawing here too rick geary also throughout his career did lots of spot elos for various publications and they're always interesting. It's not just like, oh, it's illustrating something in the story. Like, this tells some crazy tale. Like, I wish this was a comic. I don't know who this little guy is. He's a fat leprechaun, maybe. I don't know. But they're very evocative. You see one little drawing. He'll just have a little spot illo that'll make you be like, what's the story behind that? That looks crazy. And beautifully drawn. I love his style. He, nobody draws like Rick Geary. And it's just... Perfect. Also one of those great cartoonists who just draws funny. Just the way a person's face looks, you'll kind of chuckle. Here's the contents page. So it jumps around in his career and you, we can pretty much, uh, it's pretty obvious, his early strips. This is pretty much his prime. You know, he's definitely got his style down and his writing style. And this is just my criminal career from 1982. Just this hapless uh, criminal. This guy decides to embark in a life of crime and he's so incompetent. 
and moronic. It's pretty funny, all the hijinks he gets into and all the blunders he makes. The Grand Tour is from 81, a year earlier. And uh, there's just these, uh, these people showing off their house, which they open to the public. <laughs> it's just a very typical house. That's kind of the gag, is like they have tours of their house and nothing is very interesting. It's all very mundane. God, I love his art. Sorry, to, I'm probably gonna say that 50 times during this video. Teenage Escape, 1981 also. These one-pagers look very much, I'm pretty sure these are National Lampoon strips. Um, that's around the time, early 80s, when he was really contributing heavily to National Lampoon. Also could be High Times, though. I'm not sure. I wasn't reading High Times. My Transformation, also 1982. Well, later on. I love this one. It's about... This guy who sells coats and trousers. And by night, he uses these articles for what might be called unnatural activities. And he goes through this transformation. And, and uh, it's almost like he becomes a shaman. <laughs> like he kind of attains nirvana. He's floating through the sky. He, he attracts a following. But best of all, my suits are tax deductible because it's still based on his love of fine suits. Look at this one, crazy little panel. So this is 1980. This is like nascent um, Gary. He's almost at his, you know, style that we recognize, but it's a little different. Not quite there yet. It looks great though. I love all these little panels too. This is just one of his earliest murder stories. Rick Gear was always fascinated by true crime stories, but of course he always makes them kind of funny. To be honest, I mean, I shouldn't have said true crime. This might not be true at all, but it almost has a verisimilitude. He has a lot of details where it's like, yeah, maybe this was something he read in the paper. Indecision, 1984. Here we're getting full on Rick Geary. You know, look at that beautiful logo. Just his style is perfect at this point. All the characters, look at the uh, woman's face. You can tell this who this woman is just by the way he draws her face. Like he really captures her character. I love this one. It's about this, a, a dentist who moves to a small town, but he's not just a dentist. He's almost like Dr. Strange or dentist strange, where he's like a psychic dentist. He, he advises people in the town. He's almost like a psychotherapist as well. He can control the weather. It's, he's like a sorcerer who lives in a small town, but he's a good sorcerer. So he makes everything go well. This, this really reminds me of a good Doctor Strange comic, but much funnier. But then one day there's this horrible cosmic occurrence where people are mutating in the town uh, books are flying off the library shelves trees are growing upside down <laughs> this dog has human feet for instead of his paws just crazy stuff and it turns out that the fabric of the universe had snared on the spire of the Methodist church so he flies off from his bed and uh, figures out how to untangle the fabric of the universe from the spire. So he succeeds. And uh, everyone was kind of just like relieved. And he says, but I could never tell anyone the truth, least of all the Methodists. <laughs> oh man, I love this shit. This is a really early one, 79. Once again, like, you can see Rick here, like, but it's different. He's not quite there yet. Another 79 one, 
around the neighborhood of my jungle yacht. This guy's got one of those early motorhomes. And him and his wife just like to get in it and drive around the neighborhood for like an hour. As if they're going on some mini vacation. Visit their neighbors, chat with neighbors, <laughs> and they just go home. The day nothing went right is 1980. So it's still pretty early, Rick Erie. And it's kind of fun. It's just literally this couple and just nothing goes right on this night out. My Life as a One Man Band, 1982. This is a nice little character study of this guy from the 30s, you know, starts in the 30s as a one-man band. Uh, you know, he'd bring joy to a lot of people. People on the street just all loved him. They just spontaneously start dancing to his music. And uh, he, in his 90s, he takes a wife. And then he says, now I'm set up at the new mall. Sorry, the new mall on I-38. And no one gives me any trouble. <laughs> but there's no one there. Because, you know, there's, it's not like a street. You know, there's no foot traffic at a mall. There is. But it's kind of this, like, sterile environment that probably isn't good for a one-man band. A Gentleman's Occupation, 1981. This is another kind of crime one. This rich guy. just He's got everything in his life. His life is perfect. But he loves to go on little quote unquote business trips where he goes to another town and jack the rippers some prostitute and <laughs> kills them. And then he returns home to his life of wealth, excited and happy. Hometown news. This is just these, uh, these old couple are just like, ah, oh, there's a new couple moved in. We see these like kind of punky kids and they got no furniture. They just got a baby and a dog. They stay up all night. Some of the neighbors are like, oh, there goes the neighborhood. But this old couple are just like, they seem like right enough folks. Just nice, like, sorry, nice enough folks. Just trying to get by like the rest of us. So it's like a, another thing of Rick Geary. It's like most people are pretty nice and gentle in a Rick Geary comic. Of course, there's incredible evil people who are murderers. But even their demeanor is gentle and nice. Like that murderer, the rich murderer we saw two comics ago. He's just this very affable, avuncular guy. But he just likes to go out once a month and kill a prostitute. Farewell to Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> These three goofuses dig up the corpse of Charlie Chaplin and hold it for ransom. But nobody gives a shit. They're like, he's dead already. So of course, you know, they get caught. I just love that idea. The Life of a Film Buff, 79. So another kind of early one. Um, yeah, apparently Rick Geary is a big film buff. And he's just, maybe this is self, uh, this is autobiographical, but just talking about a, a daily uh, agenda for him. You know, watching tons of movies on TV, three in the morning, catches a movie on TV, goes to the theater, pu publishes his little mimeograph weekly journal about film. But that's it. Sometimes we we just have these strips. Oh, here's a perfect example where he just likes to like, I don't know, catalog certain things. American Motels, Cozy Court, Bluebird, The Park Hotel, and Another thing of Rick Erie is like he just tells comics not in a very unsequential way. It'll be just like just a random shot as if you're looking through a photo album. And they're very nondescript, um, you know, uh, images. You know, it's not like showing the outside of the hotel. Something interesting. It's just like this could be any hotel. A bunch of towels in the bathroom. The, the floor of the bathroom. Yeah, he kind of liked that. Waitress School, 1980. Yeah, even his early style looks great to me. This woman goes to Waitress School, learns all the tricks of the trade. Never have rumpled stockings. Definitely don't have long red nails. I think I missed one. I like this one. Never licked a knife after cutting the pie. 
That's just kind of common sense. The Agony of Charles Van Doren, 1980. God, this, this art looks great to me. That's one thing I almost like. His early style, a little more dense. He really was like slapping down the ink, squeezing a lot of art into these little tiny panels. The Big Bruiser, 1980, another early one. Yeah, very beautiful detail on this. Just about a couple of meteor lands in their house. And then the Air Force comes and steals it. Teddy's Day. This is just like a day in the life of Teddy Roosevelt, 1984. Um, I think I read this as a kid in Ash Lampoon. And it's pretty much just, if you've ever read about Teddy Roosevelt, this is pretty much what his life was like. He was almost like a superhero, this guy. He would just like get up at five in the morning and run 10 miles and then collect butterflies for his collection, chop a few cords of wood, spend some time with his kids, play some badminton or tennis. <laughs> he was a dynamo. Then before bed, he'd read like four to six books every night. Uh, a bunch of magazines and newspapers. And then he leaps under the covers, looking forward with delights to the morrow. I wonder if anyone actually lives that happily. Almost everyone I know is just like, yeah, how are things going? They're going. But I love how he's like this little boy. This every day is Christmas morning. I mean, he just can't wait to wake up the next day for his, all this fun, crazy stuff he gets to do. So this is the early one of the earliest trips in the book. 77. This is almost unrecognizable. Rick Geary. I've never seen these before, except for this book. Young Eisenhower. And uh, this is kind of similar to Teddy's Day. It's just like showing Eisenhower's life when he was younger, when he was a little boy. And you could tell, like, he doesn't quite, he's not quite there yet with the writing. This isn't that funny. It's not nearly as clever as the strips became. Because, I mean, he was batting high average for funniness. You know, a lot of comic strips, you know, they might be funny, but you're not going to laugh every time or think they're great. But Rick Geary is uh, pretty consistent. He was Synchronicity, 1980. So this is, uh, he's got his, like, art chops are definitely better, but still not that full Rick Geary style. Our Holy Relic. It's still... <laughs> This woman in like the middle of America has this like the left hand and forearm of St. Grenadine who was martyred in the 5th century AD. For some reason, it's in her possession. In Search of Einstein's Brain, 1982. I think this was in Epic Illustrated. I think I actually looked at this video a few weeks ago. Yes, I did, for sure. This is a great story. He's so good at the little one-pagers and half-pagers, but also really good at long-form stuff. I like this one. It's about a dog wedding. These two dachshunds are getting married. And the wedding is crazy. All their dog friends are causing chaos. There's a cake made of pure horse meat, the wedding cake. Their hotel room, their honeymoon suite... Uh, at the hotel, beef in every room. It's a dog hotel. And here they are, ready to settle down in their dog house. He draws these dachshunds like alien creatures. This was from Bop Magazine, an Eclipse uh, comic magazine all about, like, music comics. And this is him just illustrating the lyrics to Surf City by Jan and Dean. You know, the one that's like, Going to Surf City because it's two to one. Going to Surf City, going to have some fun. Two girls for every boy. So it's those happy lyrics, but it's just this kind of like old pensioner, old old guy. He seems pretty happy though, content. He's retired. And I just love he's walking. He's walking by himself on the beach, and it says two girls for every boy. Like those days are long gone for this guy. He's very old. An unsettling incident from '84. So. 
high Geary era. And this is just a weird story from the 1700s about a guy who pretty much, well, it seems like he goes crazy. And then he just kills his wife and daughter. I'm sorry, wife and uh, sister-in-law. And then he puts the cottage to, um, he, he lights it on fire. And But then we see he's got these hooves, like he's turned into a devil or something. And then he heads, they're going to hang him. And all he can say is, I am certainly at a loss as to explain for my actions. It's very nonplussed by it. This one I looked at just a few weeks ago in my Epic Illustrated uh, video. A really great strip. Our New Dad from 82. <laughs> this is such a good one. Excuse me, I'm yawning. How unprofessional. The Age of Condos, early Rick Geary, 1980. I wouldn't even guess this is Rick Geary by the art. Another one of the strips where he just lists off things. Different condos. Lark Haven, West Wind. And once again, just showing very little tiny bits of them that don't really give you a sense of what they're like. Another one, Let's Get Organized, where he's just showing all these um, office utensils. Very odd man, this Rick Geary, huh? Life in the Flight Path, about a family who lives under, right near the airport, and just their house is always in shambles. Just the, the jet planes flying overhead kind of like even make their foliage grow weird, and things rattle off the walls all the time. The Last Time I Dropped Acid from 1980. Kind of fun little acid story. The Man in the Iron Lung from 1980. It's about Dwight Eisenhower. Just talking about one of his, a day in the life of the president. But for some reason, he likes to get in an iron lung every now and then. I don't think he was an un unhealthy man. Making it in Hollywood. Just about this loser trying to become a screenwriter. This little color section here. This is really nice. Because uh, I don't even remember ever seeing Rick Gear in color growing up. So I don't know what magazine this is from. Probably National Lampoon. The Quake of 33. And uh, just this woman talking about, you know, her and her husband moved to Long Beach. And it seems like they have this kind of nice little life. But then her husband kind of starts becoming weird and kind of like repulsively weird. <laughs> and she didn't want to have relations with him. And uh, I guess he dies in this earthquake and she's kind of relieved. Because uh, she... Not only did she not even love him anymore, she was really like just repulsed by him. She didn't even want to cook meals for him anymore. But look at this art and the coloring. This is just wonderful shit. Beautiful. What a cartoonist. Oh man, look at this. It's beautiful. Poison in the Pantry, 1984. And this is about... Um, a woman who kills her husband. She ends up in jail. Adventures in Art from 1984. Just about a young graphic artist in the early 70s or mid 70s. And everyone thinks he's a fool. And uh, on the way to a job interview, He's a, there's a blizzard, his car stalls. He wanders out to seek a service station. All seemed lost. Today, of course, I'm among the best loved illustrators in America. <laughs> That's how he ends it. It totally looks like, no, nah, this guy's, he might not even live, let alone become, get the job. This is a nice one, student filmmaker, 1982. Man, I love Rick Erie in black and white enough. I wish he did more color. 
these all look so nice to me. <laughs> it's just the story of kind of of this inept filmmaker. This and he's an old man now, and he's showing his grandkids examples of his work. <laughs> like this, he's. I mean, I don't know why this. Anyone else do this? It wouldn't be that funny. But he was showing a picture. Here I fall over backward. I fall over backward again. And just the way his legs are, I don't know. It's almost like some of that B. Cleban, M.K. Brown stuff where just, I can't even put my finger on it. Just the way he draws the motion of a body looks funny to me. I think I, I have seen this before. It's in a, like a wild animals, a specific comic that was all funny animal stuff. But these are not funny animals. Once again, Rick Geary just loves uh, listing things. But this is very odd. It's all the presidents of the United States, but all a different animal. So George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. This is a very silly idea. Very odd. That's from 83. Here we have another, another one of his murder stories. Murder in the Garage from 1982. And there's this rich kid, but he wants to be an artist. And uh, he marries this woman. She's kind of terrible, though. So uh, one night he brings her with a shovel. And he's on the lamb, you know. But eventually they, he gets caught. I noticed that in all of the murder stories, almost everyone gets caught. It's... Uh, Pretty much 90% of the time. But because he got caught and became notorious, he became very famous, his art. And he got many offers while he was in jail. But he got the death penalty, so. But now his death mask can be seen today at the Smithsonian Institution. Once again, guys, I know I told you this stuff's hilarious. Remember, I have bad comic delivery. These are funny, trust me. I know I'm reading them with my crappy delivery. But this stuff is great. At the shopping mall, very early one, 79. Once again, just showing off various things at the shopping mall. He seems like one of those guys who just carries a sketchbook around. He's an observer, Rick Gary. Just finding quirky interest in the random things around us in America. My hometown... And there's another one. It's all just snapshots. Bird's eye view of the great band. A scene downtown. The blizzard of 21. Kappa Capers. I'm pretty sure this was a National Lampoon one. These sorority girls are going to get in a snowball fight with uh, the the other sorority house. But then when they come out, it's like all these frat guys are helping the other sorority house. So they beat the crap out of them in a snowball fight. But of course, they have a great time. And uh, they all hang out and have a good, you know. I guess when you're a sorority girl... Everything in life is probably pretty good and happy. This uh, Around the House, 1980, this woman's talking about how she keeps her marriage exciting. Every night when her husband's watching TV, she just jumps on him and tries to wrestle him to the ground, even though he's like 100 pounds more than her. And sometimes even, well, no need to go on. So sometimes it's foreplay. San Diego Transit. A very early one, 1978. We can see it's Rick Geary, though. So I guess sometime in 77, between 77 and 78, he figured out his style. Even the way he draws clouds weird and smoke, he has this very distinct way of drawing clouds and smoke. Nobody quite does it like him. It's very, like, pillowy or um, solid-looking. Organic. I don't know how to describe it, but... I'll point it out next time I see it. I kind of like this one, though. It's like the bus is kind of taking flight like an airplane. And when he rings the bell for his bus stop, 
the, the plate, the bus lands. A perfect landing. This one's great, Communal Life. I think this was from Gates of Eden, an anthology that was all about the 60s. This is, it says 1988 and then blank. So I'm, I'm pretty sure this is by the art. It's definitely 83, 84, 85. And this is just kind of talking about the disillusionment of a hippie guy who goes into a communal house. At first, it's great. Everyone's sharing. Everyone's, you know, living up to the communal lifestyle. They're very politically activated. They go to um, rallies. But, you know, with within a short amount of time, people are buying their own food, putting their stickers on it, like, this is mine. Because, you know, people always are selfish. You can start off with these high ideals, like, we're going to share everything and live like Marxists or something. And then one night they're going to do this, like, all-night demonstration um, at the uh, SPC. I'm sorry, a vigil at the ROTC building. And everyone says, okay, um, can you take the shift by yourself to the narrator? We're going to go get a beer but we'll be back like in an hour and we'll relieve you and then you can go off. But he's, so he's left there all alone, a one man demonstration and they never come back. They ditch him. And he, but he spends the whole night there. He's not going to give up. You know, he's very, uh, it's very idealistic. So finally he gets home at 6 AM. It's his birthday, by the way. And he had a, piece of chocolate cake, a birthday cake that he put a sticker on. He couldn't. He was like, oh, I'm going to eat this when I get home from the demonstration. And on top of their betrayal at the thing, somebody ate his piece of chocolate cake. And he just ends it with, after that, I kept to my room even more than usual. So it's just like, oh, wow. You know, this guy's uh, probably in five years, he became a yuppie. Just like a lot of those old hippies. This is nice, the, the new, this new age. And it looks like this Victorian gentleman who basically rents his face out as advertising. Even his house. This is his house. It's got a giant ad. And uh, it, turns, it kind of becomes a trend. Everyone's making money by putting things on their face, advertising. Crime in the City, 1981. Cute little story. This one's very early looking. Let's see what year it is. I think this is 77, even though I can't see the year. An unsolved murder. Once again, even in his early days, he liked these murder stories. It's weird, though, because it looks like the narrator is Hunter S. Thompson. So I don't know what this was in. Hunter S. Thompson's comics and stories, perhaps. So definitely the art's different. Yeah, some of this almost looks like... I don't know what it looks like, but it's kind of... This would be a great cartoonist, even though I prefer what he became. If there was a guy who had this style and kept, you know, for the, his whole life, I would like this cartoonist a lot. I'd be like, this is a great cartoonist but not as good as Rick Geary became. This is a pretty interesting story. Just a very elaborate whodunit. And, uh, it's, but it's an unsolved murder eventually. June 2050, 1983. And it's this guy who goes back to his uh, childhood home and everything's so similar, he's like, oh, mom's making meatloaf, dad's what, glued to the idiot box, my old room's the same, but wait, mom never wore an eye patch, and dad was hardly one to practice acrobatics during commercial breaks, and when did we add the chapel? <laughs> they built a chapel in their backyard. <laughs> I guess things have changed a great deal. Uh, I don't know why, it just cracks me up, it's so odd, his sense of humor. And it's just so subtle. This is the miraculous um, I image from 1981. These people, this couple, the wife spills wine on the carpet. It looks just like Jesus. So they get kind of famous, you know. They they charge people to come in their house and look at it. People come from as far away as Venezuela. There's articles written about them. And 
But then the wife spills another, like a Pepsi, right on this the stain, and turns it into a a mess, an indistinguishable mess. Life is quieter now, though certainly less interesting. Von Stroheim directs 1981. This is just about the decadence of Von Stroheim's film shoots. Pretty interesting. I don't know if he read this in a book, if this is all real rumors about Von Stroheim and, you know, like Hollywood Babylon type stuff, or he just made it up. On the set at all times, caviar, squab, and of course the finest champagne. Word is he once imported a professional lady flagellant from Vienna, as well as a set of genuine <laughs> Siamese twins. Man, this sounds fun. Another 60s memory, this time from 1981. There's an earlier one. And this guy's talking about like, yeah, I was totally part of the scene. I was part of the peace movement. I lived in a communal house. He was in love with a flower child who rejected him. And his mother and father, they, they couldn't even bother to conceal their distaste for him. But I like this last panel. He's like, I'm afraid upon reflection that I was a pretty insufferable young fellow. So basically he realizes like, I was just a pain in the ass asshole back then. <laughs> no wonder people didn't like me. My transgression from 1981 is another murder murder one this one's great it's like this little fantasy story I read this as a kid I can't remember what it was in maybe heavy metal journey to outer earth from 1984 and there's this whole like town that lives underground in the earth's crust and everyone's very listless there and lethargic but everyone's heard like it's almost like a legend that there's this world above and it's called the upper universe, they call it, or I guess outer earth. So they have an expedition. They're finally like, we gotta check this place out. So like a hundred guys leave for the outer earth. I think a lot of them die on the way. So we, but they finally make it out. Luckily they had sunglasses ready. They knew it was gonna be bright. And you know, they're the first people in the whole history of the civilization that ever saw the sun and the outer, the outer earth. And they're amazed by all the things like the big cities and how people, um, life was in a constant state of excitement, all citizens sharing an intense sensual intimacy. So this world is very vibrant because the underground world was just very listless. And I guess not having the sun makes everyone just feel crappy all the time. So pretty much it's just him and the captain of the expedition. And then they even lose track with each other. And so now this guy just lives on, you know, the outer earth, just like a typical dude watching his TV. He's got a dog. Totally forgot about his wife and kids. He just got a picture of him. He, he doesn't regret coming up to the outer earth at all. This is the truth about Cain and Abel from 85. <laughs> and it's we tell Cain and Abel, except that Abel's a used car dealer and Cain was a baker of donuts. <laughs> and God really likes Abel's offering of a car, but has no respect for Cain's offering of a croissant and a cupcake and a donut. So Cain kills his brother. And, uh, at the end, uh, he's arrested. Kane's arrested, but later Kane was released because of illegally obtained evidence. This is a very tiny strip, 79. Evening at the Multiplex, just talking about going to the movies. All the little snapshots of how much fun it is at the theater. Wham, that looks like another early one. Oh yeah, 79. It's kind of tiny. It's hard to read. Fun with the Kennedys. It's uh, the Kennedy family when the boys are little. The Ordeal of Robert Mitchum. I think this is a true tale. And uh, it's just it's about when Robert Mitchum got busted from, for reefer. This was a big story in the 50s. 
the fabulous miracle house. It's a house where the laws of nature are completely berserk. In the dining room, mother is taller than father. The only place known where it takes less effort to walk upstairs than down. So it doesn't sound that miraculous, actually. It sounds like a very silly house. They tur turn it into a tourist attraction. I would, you can tell by the art here. This is a very early 1978 night beat. And this is just all these like almost like crime reports. And with just little snapshots illustrating the the places. I like this. Uh, I almost think that maybe these are real because he typeset them. Like these are things he found in the paper and thought were hilarious. A 52-year-old woman called police to complain that her husband had just walked away and gone to bed while she was still talking to him. I could picture some crazy old lady calling the police and her husband for doing that. And of course the police got there and were like, lady, come on. This other old woman complained that somebody entered her home and took a bath in her tub. She didn't catch it, but she found a ring in the tub. So she's sure that some, some creep came in and bathed in her tub. We find out that it's all the, this is all the report of some, uh, a radio DJ who has like a a news report all throughout the early morning, the late night and early morning. Onions to the waitress at Denny's on East 54th who refused to serve potatoes on a dinner order because there was spaghetti on the same plate. You can't have both, she said. Poor public relations. <laughs> I would totally listen to this guy's radio show, just some old crank talking about the weird things going on in this little town. My Life in Orbit, sorry, Orbit, 1981. Another nice little strip about an astronaut. Various electrical appliances. <laughs> Rick Gary loves this shit, especially when he's younger, 77. One of the first strips he did just draws electrical appliances. Six Remarkable Innovations from 1980. Drive-In Opera. Your Name in Meat. <laughs> Exxon Church, Agitating Cheese. So here we, we see, even in 1981, he, he wanted to do Victorian murders. Um, I love the art in this. This is really perfect. So this rich woman decides to have an illicit romance. And she picks a guy who would like bother her parents. He's not very rich. And they do begin an affair. But then finally she realizes, no, I, you know, that was fun. But I have to marry some rich guy that my father approves of and, you know, live out the rest of my life that way. And uh, the guy, her lover, he's, he's heartbroken. And he threatens to, uh, to show their correspondence, their love letters to her father and kind of ruin the whole deal. So she uh, gives him some arsenic in his chocolate. But apparently the jury totally finds is, finds sympathy with her. <laughs> and this poor guy is like, the, you know, seen to be a horrible seducer and fortune hunter. And she gets acquitted. The courtroom uh, erupts in hoorays and huzzahs. And so, but her family does have to move to another city because of the scandal. There I married, bore children, and lived to my 92nd year. See, that's the way Rick, Rick Geary, like the way he would end a story, which is that weird little thing. Like this woman does this horrible crime. And then it's just like, oh yeah, didn't matter. I live to be 92. I had a wife and kids. Near Death, A True Story, 1985. This sounds like a dream he's illustrating. He's fighting a bear at the beginning. And then, then he cuts away. To, he's in the small diner. Oh, that's it. So we're for 102 pages of comics. This is a really great, uh, nice little collection. I guess at the time it was nine ninety five. I doubt this is that much money. I don't think many people care. 
But he has come out with a book since then that is like, I think it's self-published. It's Rick Geary, early works. It's like 77 to maybe 88 or something or 89. So it's probably got all this stuff in it, plus stuff after this. So I highly, I, I hope you like Rick Geary. Um, I love this guy. I'm going to definitely be showing off some other Rick Geary comics in the near future. And uh, hopefully you can find this way, way out of print, as you can imagine. It's Fantagraphics. 1985 but i don't you know i picked this up way after the fact for nothing so they're floating around there and uh they're pretty cheap so thanks for watching and i'll see you here next time at the hercules pedics academy of comic book studies